Right. So, very happy to have Kevin Edwards, Voter Star on Complex. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to try to do this without a microphone, and I'm not really worried about that, but uh, if there's an issue, let me know. So first of all, uh, who is Fodor Starr in the title? So Fodor Starr is a mythical philosopher. He defends a view of concepts that's a lot like the view defended by uh, Jerry Fodor, um, but in an important way that will become clear in a few minutes, his view is more radical. Um, and one of the suggestions that I want to make uh, in this talk is that if you're willing to go as far as Fodor, you ought to go as far as Fodor star. Okay? All right, so I'm going to start in the way they tell you not to start by apologizing. Uh, I'm going to try to, I'm kind of determined to cover a lot of ground, uh, and the sacrifice is going to be, there's way more on the slides and way more on the handout. There's big chunks of the handout that I'm not even going to pretend to cover, um, and please don't expect any real arguments. In some crucial places, I'm just going to hand wave. I'm going to assume some of this is familiar and that a lot of it, you know, these are Jerry's arguments, not mine, so uh, I'm not going to try to fully defend them. Here are some goals for today. Um, sketch out some features of Fodor's approach to concepts, including an obvious problem that it runs into. Uh, suggest, as I just mentioned, that once one has gone as far as Fodor, one might as well go as far as Fodor star, and at that point in the talk, I'm just going to table this uh, problem, uh, and then sketch out some resources that I think both Fodor and Fodor star can bring to bear uh, on the problem, and then if I have some time, uh, draw some underlying morals. Actually, I'm really going to try to draw the underlying morals. Oh, just a bit of backstory, and maybe add one more goal here. So, um, when I was a student of Fodor's, um, we fell into this kind of pattern of I'd meet with him every few weeks, and the way that these meetings went was I would say to Jerry, Jerry, your theory of concepts has this horrible problem. And he would say, oh, yeah, right. Uh, and he would give me that week's kind of half-baked solution to the problem. Uh, and I would point out why I didn't think that was going to work, uh, or in lots of cases why I thought it was inconsistent with other claims um, that he was committed to. And we'd kind of you know, argue, as you do with Jerry. Uh, and then we'd run out of time um, and make another appointment for a few weeks down the road. So to some extent, what I'm trying to do today is just get the final word in that conversation. <laughs> uh, which, of course, you know, everyone knows is really tough to do with Jerry. So if I had two hours, this is what I would attempt to accomplish. Uh, just to be more reasonable about that, uh, I'm going to just kind of blur out the last thing completely. Um, although I did put slides about that material. So uh, if you have some chance to look at those and want to ask questions, uh, that would be fine. And I am, as I said, hoping that I can draw the morals uh, at the end. Okay, so partly because I'm trying to cover so much ground, um, I'm going to really try to go back to this outline at various points. So at least, you know, when we're lost, we know roughly where we're lost, okay? Most of the talk is really going to be this introductory section. Okay, so what are concepts? So just what's the starting point, right? When different theorists are proposing competing theories of concepts, what is it that they're um, in the business of trying to do? As a matter of fact, I think that's a really good question. And I think uh, the literature could use more discussion of this question. I think there's a real risk, especially when you look across philosophers and psychologists, of people talking past one another because they have a different kind of agenda uh, in the background. But that's a different talk. So what I'm going to do today is just help myself to what I think is the way that Fodor um, starts thinking about concepts. So here is you know, kind of the Fodor worldview, call it the Fodor-inspired functional language of thought representational theory of mind. So start with the notion of a thought, where that's something like a basic unit of cognition. So basic unit in the sense of these are the things that are truth evaluable, these are the things that are inferentially related to one another. Okay? The notion of a thought is supposed to be neutral with respect to um, whether the thought is a belief or a desire, uh, or so on and so forth. So I take it that Fodor continued to be a functionalist about propositional attitude types. So whether a thought is a belief or a desire depends on uh, its functional role. Of course, Fodor is a language of thought theorist, so he thinks that thoughts have internal, roughly language-like uh, structure. To quote Stephen Neal, if you have a working shift key, translating from English to mentalese is simple, right? You just put everything in capital letters. 
So you get these familiar thoughts, grass is green, water is wet, Hesperus is a planet, and so on and so forth. So there's the basic framework, and I think it just falls out of that, that there's this question about, okay, what are the basic constituents of thoughts, right? And that's what we're theorizing about when we're trying to come up with a theory of concepts. I also wanted to mention just something very quick about Fodor's commitment to representationalism. So he thinks that concepts are the primary bearers of representational content. Now I kind of struggle to put his view of representation in a neutral way, since among other things it changed, kind of evolved throughout time. So here's this week's attempt to capture this uh, as neutral as, uh, in as neutral a way as possible. Representation is some kind of naturalistically respectable mind-to-world relation. Roughly, concepts are tokened in a way that depends on features of reality, and it's in virtue of that dependence relation that concepts refer or represent features of reality, whether it's individuals, kinds, properties, uh, and so on. Um, oh, I, I guess I should say, I'm just going to run together talk of representation and reference as far as this talk is concerned. All right, there's a few things that I'll just insert as side notes uh, as we go that don't play an essential role in the talk. They're just sort of relevant things um, that I have some thoughts about, um, and maybe they'll be, they'll be helpful, or maybe uh, someone else will have something more insightful to say. So uh, these two points aren't going to play a significant role in the talk, but I think it's not entirely clear what Fodor thinks about the following two questions that have to do with representation. So first, What's the relata of the representation relation? Is representation a relation that's defined for token concepts or for types of concepts? And if it's for types of concepts, what are the types, right? So I think that's just a question. I remember talking to Jerry about this and not getting a, a totally straight answer. And it seems like the answer to that question should matter. Second, uh, does the same account of representation that applies to basic concepts also apply to complex concepts? Or is there some other kind of you know, compositional story about the content of complex concepts. Okay, so here's my oversimplified view of the landscape as far as theories of concepts are concerned. You know, I think there's lots of ways of dividing up the landscape. I just find this one to be um, particularly illuminating, especially given um, that it's a backdrop for thinking about um, Jerry's contribution uh, to the topic. So hidden structure theories, role theories, and then, of course, atomistic theories. So the old paradigm of hidden structure theories is that concepts are definitions. So they're complex structures that encode necessary and sufficient conditions for membership in a category or uniquely specify some uh, individual. The newer version of that, especially, or at least a newer version of that, especially if you look at psychological literature, is the claim that concepts are prototypes. So again, some kind of complex structures, typically out of some um, um, structures that are composed out of some kind of feature representations, um, not supposed to capture necessary and sufficient conditions for membership in a category, but just statistical information about members of the category. Okay, role theories. So concepts are individuated by various features of the role that they play in cognition, whether that's role in inference, which philosophers have typically been interested in, or role in categorization, which psychologists have typically been interested in. What's left over if you deny both of those two? You end up with atomism, which first and foremost is a negative thesis. The basic concepts are not individuated by features of their internal structure or features of their role. And I'll say more about Fodor's particular version of concept atomism in a few minutes, and then also the view that I'm attributing to Fodor star. OK, I thought it might be helpful to talk about a case study to say a little bit more about the claim that concepts are prototypes, but actually I think I'll skip that. I'll just very briefly mention that if you look at standard presentations of prototype theory, they look like a version of what I'm calling hidden structure theories, but maybe that's actually not the most charitable way to understand them. It might be um, uh, that it's better to think of them as some kind of a role theory. And I'm pretty sure that's not my idea. I think it might be Eric Margolis' idea or uh, came out in something that he uh, co-authored. OK, so what are Fodor's arguments for concept atomism? Well, he doesn't have arguments for atomism so much as arguments that are purported to strike down all of the uh, available alternatives. So this argument, I'm really not going to say anything interesting about. One reason that Fodor thinks the concepts can't be definitions is just because 
there's a long history of trying to come up with definitions that's been a failure. Okay? Uh, yes, there's lots of things I'm not talking about here. So I'm setting aside stipulated definitions, theoretical terms, the one definition that philosophers have come up with, bachelor equals unmarried man. Even that one's controversial because of the Pope and various other cases. And then there's a long list of clever things that George Ray has to say about this view that I'm also not going to address. I don't mean to pick on George, it's that I'm worried about George, so I need to explicitly get him out of the room. Okay, here's the arguments I want to spend a little bit more time on, but still really not a lot of time. This is what I'll call Fodor's triad. So I think if you look at Fodor's work on concepts over the years, and some of this was co-authored with Ernie Lepore, you can sort of discern three lines of arguments that have been developed in some detail and wielded against virtually all the competing uh, theories of concepts. So I think it's helpful to think of them as falling under one of these three headings. In each case, the basic idea is Jerry thinks there's a non-negotiable constraint on theories of concepts and that virtually all theories of concepts fail to live up to that constraint. Okay? So the shareability or what Jerry called publicity argument, the compositionality argument, and the circularity or, or really non-circularity argument. I'm going to take a big shortcut here. I have some passing, a passing comment to make about uh, sort of Jerry on circularity issues that I hope is helpful for at least some people who might have found some of those arguments baffling. And then I'm going to take the shareability argument and compositionality argument introduce them in a very superficial way, and then suggest that they can be kind of cooked down into something uh, more general, namely the claim that concepts need to be sufficiently robust. And I think that's a kind of driving force behind the way that Fodor's thinking about concepts. Okay, so here's my passing suggestion about Fodor and circularity. This is really just something that's helped me in thinking about various uh, contexts in which Fodor appeals to her, holds a circularity accusation against the theory. For me, it's been really illuminating to think about the various circularity arguments as really resting on a key premise that's a claim about priority. Okay? And it's typically the claim that concepts need to be prior to something else. So I'll just briefly mention the first of these bullet points and uh, uh, not worry about the next two. So here's, I think, what Fodor thinks about what Fodor thinks about categorization and why, given this way of thinking about categorization, it's not a useful way to try to individuate concepts. Okay? He thinks that for an appeal to categorization to play a role in analyzing a concept, so say the concept C, categorization is going to be, have to un be understood as categorization according to C. Okay? So the idea is, you know, if the fact that I can sort of split this thing out from the rest of the world, right? If that's supposed to play some role in my concept of analyzing or explaining my concept of a water bottle, it's not good enough that I can pick this thing out as, you know, object that happens to be on this lectern or something like that. That's just not relevant, right? He thinks in order for categorization to play a role, the relevant notion of categorization is going to have to be very rich. It's going to have to be conceptual. It's going to have to involve the concept of this water bottle, right? Okay, so just suggestion. I think what's really going on in these arguments is there's a strong priority claim there. All right, aside from that, I'm not going to say anything else about uh, the circularity arguments. So very briefly, the shareability argument. The basic idea is that concepts are the kind of thing that can be shared across agents, context, differences in background belief, and so on and so forth. So there's the quote-unquote non-negotiable um, constraint. But then Jerry also thinks that prototypes, exemplars, patterns of inference, all the standard resources out of which theories of concepts are typically constructed just won't live up to that constraint. Okay? So those various things are just not sufficiently, uh, well, I'll use the term robust or stable um, uh, to make sense of shareability. So uh, conclusion, concepts can't be prototypes, exemplars, patterns of inference, theories, and so on and so forth. Again, there's a whole bunch of stuff I'm setting aside, including uh, more clever stuff that George Ray has to say in defense of uh, various views, in particular about the availability of an analytic synthetic distinction uh, and things along those lines. Similar sort of move with the compositionality argument. So in order to make sense of the productivity and systematicity of thought, concepts need to be compositional. Not easy to say exactly what that means, but roughly, Concepts need to um, combine to form complex concepts and whole thoughts in, let's say, a relatively simple and stable way. 
And Jerry thinks prototypes, exemplars, patterns of inference, and so on and so forth, just don't compose. Okay, there's a lot of sort of sub points here that I could have made. Um, I think Rochelle talked uh, briefly yesterday about the now infamous pet fish example. So the idea is a prototypical pet fish is neither a prototypical pet nor a prototypical fish. So it looks like prototypes just don't combine in any at least neat and tidy way. Um, well, another point that Jerry makes that I guess I'll mention um, just briefly is that categorization and inference and other features of a concept's role are typically only manifest in normal or ideal conditions. And he thinks the notion of a normal or an ideal condition isn't going to compose. Okay, so his, famous, his favorite example of this is the night flying bluebird. And the idea is supposed to be the kinds of conditions that are ideal for recognizing blue things just screen off the kinds of conditions that are ideal for recognizing things that fly. Okay. So conclusion, concepts, prototypes, exemplars, patterns of inference, so on and so forth, um, can't be concepts. And again, yes, there's a ton of things that I'm setting aside. You know, I'm not trying to get into the weeds here um, and defend these arguments in any kind of detail. Here's a suggestion that I want to make. I think the driving force underlying these arguments is the claim that concepts need to be robust. And hopefully I've said enough about these arguments to give you a sense that that might be um, uh, a real driving force. So I think shareability and compositionality can be viewed as manifestations of this more general phenomenon that concepts need to be robust. What does that mean? Concepts need to be able to underwrite psychological generalizations that hold across people and times and in spite of differences in background beliefs and so on and so forth. Concepts have to be able to make sense of, underwrite an account of communication, even just how we understand one another non-linguistically. They need to be able to combine with one another in a stable way, and so on and so forth. So just you know, suggestion for how to kind of step back and squint and think about some of these arguments. The, the, the typical resources that are used to construct orthodox theories of concepts just don't look like they're going to be sufficiently robust. Right? And Fodor really wants to enforce this idea that concepts need to be. So that's um, my suggestion. All right, so what survives this triad of arguments? Well, it's concept atomism, right? It's the view that concepts are individuated by features that are independent of facts about their structures uh, and roles. That's not to say that concepts don't have internal structure or don't have roles, right? That would be a crazy thing uh, to deny. It's that they're individuated in a way that's orthogonal to those considerations. So here's Fodor's version of concept atomism. He thinks concepts are individuated really along two dimensions. So first of all, there's representation or referential content. And then second, and this is the part that I want to make a little bit of a fuss about, he thinks concepts can also be individuated by their formal, pro formal properties um, or their quote unquote architectural features. Um, and the parentheses here, just don't ask what these are. I really mean that to be both of those, right? It's maybe a little obscure um, what both of these notions are. Fodor Starr's version of concept atomism is just like Fodor's, but it drops the appeal to formal properties or architectural features. Maybe a less extreme way of putting this is Fodor Starr is at least sufficiently worried about the appeal to formal properties that Fodor Starr would really like to be able to do without that appeal unless he's really backed into a corner, okay? <laughs> All right, so tabling that just for a second, here is the obvious problem, and I'm assuming this is uh, familiar just given the name. It's just a psychological analog of this uh, famous problem that's plagued referentialists in philosophy of language. So it looks like atomistic construals of concepts are robust. They have this feature that Jerry wants, right? In part because they're so coarse grained. And that gets the view into trouble. So it just looks like there's lots of intuitive cases that involve pairs of concepts that are intuitively distinct concepts, but they're co-referring. Okay? They're more fine-grained than the theory seems to have the resources to handle. So here's the familiar list. Hesperus and Phosphorus, Cicero and Pelley, Superman and Clark Kent, Triangle and Trilateral, uh, Renate versus Chordate, and so on. So you might think, well, this is a place where Fodor has a big advantage over Fodor star, because Fodor can appeal to formal properties or architectural features in order to draw the additional distinctions that are needed. So here's what I want to try to suggest 
uh, really in the remainder of the talk. I think Fodor's appeal to formal properties puts him in a kind of unstable situation. I'm not going to claim there's a knockdown argument, but I think there's an obvious instability, and I think that instability actually cuts pretty deep. Okay. Second, in spite of having a very coarse grain theory of concepts, per se, so theory of concepts in particular, right? I think even Fodor Starr has really a rich array of resources that he can bring to bear on this problem. So I'll spend a little bit of time laying out at least some of those. And then three, you know, here's um, the moral that follows from that second point. If that's right, if even Fodor Starr that has this very austere coarse grain theory of concept, concepts has available resources to handle these hard cases, then hard cases, that's not really the issue, right? And it's a kind of dialectical mistake to focus too much uh, time and energy uh, on that. So what I want to end up suggesting is that the availability of at least this position in logical space means that what we should really be thinking about is what I'll call the explanatory, the, how to divide the explanatory labor between a theory of concepts and various, let's call them non-conceptual explanatory resources. So hopefully that will make more sense uh, that suggested moral by the time we get to the end. All right. So Fodor star versus Fodor. So here's what I want to suggest is unstable about Fodor's appeal to formal properties. And for the most part, I'm just going to drop out the stuff about architectural features. So that's supposed to be things like mental files, right? You'll probably be able to predict what my worries about uh, those kinds of things are, um, but I won't talk about them explicitly. So here's the idea. Think about why Fodor invokes formal properties in the first place. Well, it's in, order to, it's in order to make sense of mental processes. It falls out of his commitment to a computational account of mental processes. So formal properties are the properties of symbols or representations over which mental processes are defined, right? In particular, computational processes. So that's the role that they're playing in the overall theory. Okay, but remember, according to Fodor's own arguments, facts about a concept's role, and presumably that includes its role in computational processes, right? that's just the, not the right kind of resource out of which to build a theory of concepts. You're going to end up with something much too fine-grained to do the kind of work that Jerry thinks a theory of concepts needs to be able to do. So hopefully that's enough to make the following question uh, rhetorical. If facts about a concept's role can't underwrite a theory of concepts, they're just not the right kind of resources out of which to build a theory of concepts, how can the properties that are only invoked to make sense of mental processes hope to uh, play that explanatory role? Okay, so that's the, my claim about what's unstable about his appeal to formal properties. Now, to be fair, now that's not a knockdown argument, right? So there is the following possibility. You might say, yeah, look, formal properties were invoked for one reason, but once we've got them on the table, right, we can ask them to do uh, other kinds of explanatory work. That's fair game. So what I want to suggest is, no, really, there's a, th this apparent instability is really the first sign of a much deeper fundamental tension. So here's uh, what I have in mind. The coarse grain nature of concepts that goes along with the need to vindicate the ways in which concepts need to be robust, that's just intention with the fine grain resources that are needed to resolve Frege's problem. Okay? There's just this fundamental tension between these two kinds of explanatory tasks, or really categories of explanatory tasks. And the suggestion is, there just isn't going to be one single taxonomy of entities that's going to be able to do both of these kinds of things. There's just a fundamental tension between the need for concepts to be robust and then the need for whatever it is that resolves Frege's problem to be fine-grained. One thing that I think helps to um, make that instability really vivid is to think about what I'll call the persistence and proliferation of Frege's problem. So here's the idea. I think that Frege's problem is a much more loose and poorly behaved, I'm not sure I have the right adjectives here, but something like that, phenomenon that people have given it credit for. So I think as philosophers, you know, we're kind of trained to focus on these particular cases, right? We think Hesperus and Phosphorus, there must be a Hesperus concept and a Phosphorus concept, right? 
And we don't necessarily, we're not used to paying attention to the fact that actually it doesn't take that much to get a new instance of Frege's problem off the ground. So I, I kind of struggled to capture this in a, in a fully general way, but here's a stab at it. It seems like what's, what's the basic thing that's required to get an instance of Frege's problem off the ground? Well, someone just needs to have some reason to worry. That reason could be completely misguided, right? To worry that some thing is really two things, or some property or kind is really uh, two or more properties of co or kinds, that's enough to get an instance of Frege's problem off the ground. And it's not just an issue about you know, what's going on in the head of that individual person. If we're going to use our concepts to characterize their propositional attitudes, right, then this problem is inherited by uh, all of us. Okay, so that's what I have in mind by the proliferation uh, of, of Frege's problem. So again, I think it's, it just takes a bit of crea creativity to come up with a new version of Frege's problem you know, that outstrips whatever previous resources were thrown at the problem. So you can just come up with cases you know, quite easily. Imagine that there was a group of ancient astronomers who wrongly thought that what we now know to be the planet Venus, it wasn't just two distinct heavenly bodies, it was three, right? Then they got involved in some kind of competition, like who can come up with you know, good reasons for worrying that there might be more and more uh, heavenly bodies. So they got to four and five, right? That seems um, possible. So that's just an illustration of how instances of this problem can get off the ground really for a you know, pretty poorly behaved um, uh, number of reasons. All right. So not surprisingly, Voter Stars suggested resolution to this. Stop asking the theory of concepts to solve all of your problems, in particular Frege's problem, right? Follow Fodor, preserve a robust theory of concepts. That's uh, non-negotiable. So just cleave to a coarse-grained representational or, or refer referential theory of concepts, right? Um, and then appeal to various non-concept constitutive resources to explain um, these and other hard cases. So what I want to do next amounts to adding a little bit of flesh to what those resources um, might look like, OK? So I'm going to focus on three things. And I think it's really the third of the three that is potentially the most powerful. So first, and I think this one's relatively uh, easy to wrap your head around, uh, well, both Fodor and Fodor Star are committed to the language of thought, including the claim that some concepts are complex, right? So that's going to give them some resources to deal with at least some pairs of concepts that are um, uh, coextensive. Why? Because the concepts can have internal structure and then have constituents that don't even co-refer. So presumably angle and side or lateral um, don't co-refer. Maybe the same thing for morning star and evening star. Right? Maybe the same thing for something like the difference between the concept water and the concept H2O. Okay. This resource is a little, uh, well, maybe I should say something quick about the previous resource. How much work you're going to be able to squeeze out of that resource is going to depend on which concepts are complex and which ones aren't, right? And Jerry famously thought that most of them weren't. So that's not going to be super helpful uh, for him. Okay. This point is a little bit trickier. It has to do with the metaphysics of, of reference or representation potentially being helpful. So here's the idea. If a theory of representation involves a law-like dependence relation, which Jerry uh, famously does, then it can be sensitive to counterfactual distinctions. And in virtue of that, it can hope to distinguish concepts um, that refer to distinct properties that are coextensive co but not necessarily coextensive. So just to, to get this idea on the page, you know, here's a toy theory of representation that you're not supposed to take seriously. It's just an illustration of this one point. Let's assume a concept C represents a property or kind, small, sorry, small c, if and only if that concept is or would be caused by C you know, in similarly sufficient counterfactual situations. So maybe we can apply this to Quine's famous example of Rene and Corday. So following Quine, let's assume that everything that's actually a renate, a creature with a kidney, is also a chordate, creature with a heart. Is that right, by the way? Is a chordate a creature with a heart? OK. No, uh, no it's not right. It's not backbones. 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 In, in, in some invertebrates have hearts. Yeah, but isn't that chordate with an H? 
I think Klein might have made up chordate. Um, anyway. <laughs> All right. Uh, if Klein didn't, I am. Okay. Chordate is hereby stipulated as a creature with a heart. Um, okay. So how does this resource um, help to draw this distinction? Well, even though everything that's actually a renate is a chordate, there's some possible renates that aren't chordates, right? And that's enough that the theory of reference, if it's a law-like dependence relation, can select between certain, uh, in certain possible worlds, sorry, the fact that in certain possible worlds, renate cause renate and chordates don't, right, is enough to underwrite the claim that renate, the concept, refers to the property of being a renate, whereas chordate refers to the property of being a chordate. Okay. I can't think of very many examples other than Quine's case where this resource would be helpful. Um, you know, if the metaphysics of reference turned out to be such that we could somehow refer to hyperintentional properties. I don't know what that kind of a theory would look like, but it's at least a, a kind of resource that's on the table, depending on how the metaphysics of reference or representation work out. Okay, here's the resource that I really care about that I think um, is arguably the most important, and I'll call it the appropriate and denigrate strategy. So the idea is Fodor or Fodor star can take help themselves to various resources that competing theories of concepts have invoked, right? And just denigrate them to non-constitutive, non-concept constitutive status, but still appeal to them for the purposes of drawing various distinctions, right? In order to handle the so-called hard cases. Okay, so maybe it helps to uh, make the following point. Theories of concepts, you know, like theories of uh, lots of things, are not theories of any old types of concepts. I assume the notion of a type of concept is very cheap. So there's types like concepts that are token while standing in New Brunswick city, New Brunswick city limits. So, so I assume there's some privileged taxonomy of concepts that we're after. It's not just any old uh, theory of types of concepts. It's a particular taxonomy. So call those concept types just to have a term to work with. Then the idea is concepts can have properties that are not essential to the individuation of concept types per se, right? Um, but those kinds of properties can still be appealed to if what we're in the business of doing is not type individuating concepts, but just finding distinctions when we need them to make sense of various hard cases. So here's a suggestion for how that could go. The Hesperus phosphorus case. Why are we inclined to claim that there's distinct concepts, Hesperus and Phosphorus, in capital letters? Well, here's a potential answer. Well, there's various tokens of the type Venus, or if you want to remind yourself um, that that's supposed to be uh, to capture also Hesperus and Phosphorus, um, you could resort to something awkward like that. So various tokens of the type Venus, some of them are inferentially linked to certain morning-involving thoughts, but not to certain evening-involving thoughts, and vice versa. Some of them are inferentially linked to certain evening-involving thoughts and not morning-involving thoughts. Or insert you know, whatever it is that the conceptual role person is going to appeal to here. So the idea is, we haven't vindicated the claim that there's a Hesperus concept and a Phosphorus concept, right? We've cleaved to the claim that there's just Venus. But there's various tokens of that type, and we can find, we can draw a distinction when we need them in order to explain what's going on with someone's psychology by appealing to various features that those concepts have while denying that those features, features are concept constitutive. Okay, I have a few points just to try to make that move seem more plausible than it might otherwise seem. So one is just to point out, you know, the relevant features are actually uh, fairly open-ended. So it's not just actually manifest features of concepts, you know, we can also appeal to dispositional and maybe um, explain that in terms of counterfactuals. And that might be especially relevant if it looks like what's really going on with a, an instance of Frege's problem has something to do with the concepts having different roles. Okay. Here's a point that I guess I'm inclined to think is quite important. It might seem like our use of these na putative names of concepts, or yeah, Hesperus and Phosphorus, like our use of those terms is sufficiently stable, that that's a pretty good reason to think we've really succeeded in naming concepts here. And our theory of concepts ought to vindicate um, that assumption. 
I'm not sure that that's right. So this appearance of stability might be a tribute to, I think this is a quote from Kripke, the education of philosophers, right? It's true that we tend to focus on these particular examples, and we tend to assume that the examples are fairly straightforward. You know, we can get undergraduates into the swing of the Hesperus Phosphorus problem in a you know, third year philosophy of language class in about three minutes. So the suggestion is, you know, we might have a kind of inflated sense of just how stable the relevant uh, phenomenon is. And if you just think about it for a minute, you know, do we really know what we're talking about when we invoke Hesperus and Phosphorus? If we're pushed to, you know, what exactly is it that distinguishes these two concepts and what is it, you know, generally, the kind of thing that could underwrite generalizations across people that putatively possess the Hesperus concept and the phosphorus concept and think some things about Hesperus they don't think about phosphorus. I think it's not easy to get going on that process of really um, pinning this down. So that might be a reason to think, you know, actually these, con these putative concept types are maybe not as stable as uh, we might have thought. Related point, given, given the persistence of Frege's problem that I was talking about a few slides ago, that might also make you worry that if we go down the road of thinking that our theory of concepts has to be sensitive has to provide a general solution to Frege's problem psychologized, we're going to end up with hopelessly fine-grained concepts, right? Okay. Are there instances of Frege's problem that evade the you know, three resources that I've introduced thus far? Well, I think the third one has the potential to be quite powerful. So here's an admittedly tentative suggestion. Whatever resources are used to motivate an instance of Frege's problem can be just appropriated by the atomist, denigrated to non-concept constitutive status, and then uh, used to explain the, uh, the purported hard case. Oh, great. I'm not going to go over time. So here are some brief suggested morals or tentative conclusions. I just think everyone is going to find a way to explain the putatively hard cases. I mean, I'd focus sort of for dialectical reasons on a really radical, austere version of concept atomism. And I think even that kind of view has at least enough resources to work with that it can claim to be able to resolve these putatively hard cases. I think it's important to um, not think of this act of cleaving to an austere, coarse-grained view of concept individuation as somehow taking away available resources. So what's really going on is the atomist is enforcing a certain way of categorizing those resources and being, you know, hopefully really clear about what kind of explanatory res work various resources can and cannot do. So that's what I mean when I say concept atomism is really a proposal for how to divide the explanatory labor. In a way, I think it's not helpful to advertise the view as a theory of concepts, right? Because that makes it look like, wow, what the theory of concepts can do is far less than what competing theories of concepts can do, right? So I think the interesting question that's really put on the table by the atomist and, you know, by my lights, by Jerry, is, well, what exactly, what kind of thing can we ask a theory of concepts um, to do, right? And what's the best way to package up the work that a theory of concepts is supposed to do as, suppo uh, as opposed to um, other kinds of theoretical resources. So the metaphor that I'll just end with is concepts are something like a robust, stable backbone of cognition, but definitely not uh, the whole story. All right, thanks. assumption that seems to me to be right, that um, thoughts cause behavior. And that they cause behavior um, in virtue of the concepts that they contain. And uh, when we start to think about, let's take another example, Mark Twain, Samuel yeah. Clemens, right? There are, there are, if we, 
there's, it's easy to come up with examples where people behave in this, uh, let's call marriage. She behaves in a certain way, yes. and we've got to say, what's the cause of her behavior? Yes. And we have, if we're going to explain that, we have to make a distinction yes. between her having a concept which um, <coughs> she would express using the term Mark Twain and a concept she would express using the term Samuel Clemens. So to get at what's causally significant, we have to distinguish yes. between two concepts here. We yes. can't identify yes. the concept. That, of course, both these concepts have the same reference, yes. but they have the same reference in different ways, and these different ways are causally significant. And now, you could, and this seemed to be the way you're going here, yeah. you could say, oh, look, um, I'm just going to abandon that requirement on concepts. But that's an awful No, I don't, I don't yeah. think that. I, mean, I don't if, think Jerry so thinks that. You've yeah. got to bloody well explain yeah. behavior. So, uh, so I totally agree. So, and I'm worried about something in the vicinity of this. Okay. Um, it's the big worry that I have with the whole project, really. But, but one distinction just to start with. So um, I think an important question is, are there, are there intentional generalizations that need to be vindicated? So if the kind of explanation that you have in mind involves a genuine, robust, intentional generalization, so if there are genuine, robust, intentional generalizations that are, that are more fine-grained than this theory of concepts affords, that's a problem. Yeah. That I hope. That's on the handout. I would have thought, I would <laughs> Under thought, the heading of Fregian generalizations. Yeah, I would have thought there yeah. are. Yeah, so. The generalization right. one, as Quine would say, uh, using a, you know, we, 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 we have to have propositional attitudes picked out of, uh, by opaque description. Right. Sorry, I'm going to see if I can get this really quickly, but no, I can't. Um, OK, so if, if that's what the issue comes down to, there's a slide on the handout that I give you <laughs> about, it's called Fregian generalizations. And if that's the case, I, that's the thing I'm most worried about, OK? It's too bad Susan Schneider isn't here. I think mean, she has also has some things. Yeah, so I have some hand wavy things to say about that. Um, but but I, I'm, I'm just fully, that's what I think is the problem. Right? And if, if that's what it comes down to, then it's really hard to see how um, we can justify holding on to a coarse grain account if it's just yep. not the kind of thing that's going to do the real explanatory work that a theory of concepts, even according to Jerry, is, is supposed to do. Right? Yep. You know, that being said, um, this point that I made about the kind of instability of these cases, right? I, I don't uh, think that's true either. Yeah, so you. I mean, but right. that's another issue. Yeah. I mean, look, uh, you're learning. Does that take my case? There's only some instability here if we can't actually give, if we don't have at least the beginnings of a theory of reference for these two sorts of concepts, which show the different ways in which they pick out the. No, no. Concepts. So, what I mean by instability in this context is whether or not there's a, the explanation is going by way of a generalization of the whole oh, thing. Right? And my suggestion is a lot of these cases that we think look like that, you know, Hesperus and Phosphorus, Cicero and Tully, maybe actually don't. If you try to say, you know, what does something have, what, what does the concept have to look like so, such that someone believes that Hesperus is a planet, and not Phosphorus is a planet? I'm not sure that that at the end of the day there's a, a, a robust generalization underlying those sorts of cases. But if there is, I agree there's problems. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. I don't want to just end up in this corner, but. Um, so I think there's. I think that there isn't a problem that I think you think there is. Um, so I think oh, that would be nice. <laughs> well, we'll see. Um, so if you want to, if you want to say that the semantic value of a concept is determined by how it comports with other items that have semantic value, that's where you're going to get into problems about holism. If you can't cordon off the conceptual liaisons that are meaning constitutive from the ones that yeah. aren't, um, then you have nothing to prevent you from saying that every concept has its content partly determined by agreement. But we do leave semantics, and you look at the uh, mechanical operation of the cognitive system. So when you adopt the perspective of methodological solipsism, 
Yeah. Now, if you want to individuate the symbols of the system, it's yeah. perfectly okay to say, well, we need to look and see what the mechanism, what features the mechanism is sensitive to. Yeah. So you can get a very, you can get a Hesper symbol that is a, that's a distinct from a phosphor symbol, and what makes them distinct is that the mechanism treats them differently. Yeah. Um, and that's why, you know, if you if you don't, if Oedipus doesn't know that Jocasta is his mother, he, yeah. he does behavior to be irrational if he didn't know it was his mother because he's using yeah. his Jocasta symbol. Um, so I think that there, there isn't any, there's not a, any inconsistency in dividing it that way. Now what you do get is extremely, well, I don't think it's a question of the degree of fine gradedness, but what you do get is you get the possibility that I make conceptual distinctions that you don't. Yeah. So, um, you know, I know that Clark Kent is Superman, Superman, Lois doesn't. So she's got her as it were Clark Kent beliefs and her Superman beliefs. Yeah. And when I think that I'm sharing a belief with Lois, like um, that Superman is very strong, what's the principle that says that my mentally symbol is type identical with which one of her symbols? Right. So I think that what happens is you get you get the nice fine grainedness that you need for right. for the intra cog, intra psychic right. um, uh, explanations. But you really run into a problem about how you do interpersonal type identification of mentally symbols. Yeah, so, so of course I don't think it's going to be as simple as that, because even in the interpersonal case, you're going to get changes of belief, and, and you're going to, like, it's not clear that that, what you're wanting well, to call a concept is going to be stable, even changes, in the head of one Changes of belief shouldn't affect the individuation of the symbols. So a Superman belief is going to be a belief, of a, a, a sentence in the belief box that contains a symbol that refers to Superman. But now you've got this problem. Well, does I don't understand how you've made the holism issue go away then. Because I'm giving you, um, so. Uh, like if a change. To be a baseball player. Yeah. Being a baseball player is a holistic property in the sense that you can't be a baseball player all by yourself. There have to be, it's, it's, it's a, a, a not an anatomistic property. There have to be other baseball players in order for there to be even one baseball yeah. player. But if you want to individuate baseball players one from the other, baseball players are realized as human beings, and all you need are the individuation conditions for human beings to say that you've got, you know, Sandy Koufax over here and some other baseball player over there. Yeah. Um, and it's the same thing I think with mental symbols. Um, I mean, we can perfect. Well, you know, if we we distinguish orthography on the basis of. of yeah, but I, I think the worry is that that's going to end up being hopelessly fine grained. Well, why do you say hopelessly fine grained? I mean, I don't have multiple yeah. representations for everything that I think about. And even uh, but it's not just the ones you have. It's the ones that you could have or that you would have if you thought something different. And why do I, well, why do I have to have no, some here, Here's one way of maybe stepping. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think this is like uh, getting, yeah, too complicated. <laughs> but yeah, Randy. How does Frege's problem work if it starts with the numbers, right? So. We could define, we could have one concept which is the multiplicative identity, and we could have another concept which is the number you get when you subtract two from three. Yeah. Right? And whoa, who knew? Yeah. Those turn out to be the same concept. Is that a problem? Well, no, those are going to be a pretty good candidate for being complex concepts, I would have thought. So there's not to me, they're the most elementary imaginable concept, <laughs> but. The where I'm headed is yep. if you start if you start with the numbers, Frege's problem is everywhere, but it's not a problem. That is, uh, it's, you see why I say that? Um, it's it's not intuitively a problem. It's a problem if someone ends up saying we want our theory of concepts to be able to do certain kinds of work, and according to the theory, all of these concepts that you want to be distinct end up being all the collapsed into the same concept, right? Well. I mean, I think Frege's problem is a, is a problem for this kind of view. No, wait a second. They don't collapse into the same concept, as you right. can see immediately by moving to more complicated examples. Like, uh, we define one number as the proportion between the circumference of a circle and its yeah. diameter, and we have a different definition, which is the limit approached by this infinite series. Yeah. And after a lot of hard work, and who knew, and so on, and it turns out that the limit that if, uh, of this infinite series is the same number, but they were certainly separate concepts, right? Yeah, but, uh, so, but that's the problem. So, so the dialectical situation is there's a view that says 
There's good reasons for individuating concepts in this coarse grained way. Here's the horrible problem. Cases like that, you know, the theory just seems to get them completely intuitively wrong. So that's, right? so that's, that's the problem. problem. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm trying to, to, to resist. But yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so um, in, in the Jury's um, uh, paper, uh, you know, um, about the legal force, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a complicated kind of uh, dignity lexical theory of the legal force, which basically says that the belief that, say, Superman flies is to, you know, there be some sort of presentation of the ancient basket. There's also a functional role specified, right? Right. So could you um, address the Which paper was this? The substitutional or the and so couldn't you um, think of, you know, so this functional role that we're going to discuss of the belief that the propositional confidence applied by that clause. And that gets you something where Clark Kent flies and Superman flies are head by head alive. But then Superman flies and has this, if you specify a functional role with that, that's not what you specify with Clark Kent flies. Yeah. That yeah. And, and, and to add, I, I'm not sure if this is in the paper, but that kind of reference is context sensitive. So yeah. those that, those two references might vary from speaker to speaker, but they would be, you know, they basically, you know, yeah. set it up that. Yeah, so, so I think that might be consistent with everything that I've suggested. Um, as long as those functional roles are, are, are not concepts, right? So there are these fine-grained things that can play some kind of explanatory role, but they're not going to underwrite intentional generalizations, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I and mean, is that the paper where he says something about um, there's a line in it to the effect that um, He's worried about holding, he's worried about these issues basically. And he says, maybe it turns out that I'm not really a realist about propositional attitude types, and that's okay as long as I'm a realist about intentional content. So I mean that's a kind of flag that he's worried that 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 functionalist views of things have this implication that the entities they end up reconstructing are going to be hopelessly fine grained if there won't be something there, right? So if, if I'm thinking about the same paper, yeah, that's a suggestion that he's going in the direction I'm trying to push him here. Right. Yeah. I don't think that that's what he ended up doing later when he starts invoking talk of formal properties, mental files. You know, those sound like robust entities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did give it up in the end of the expert. It was five years later. It was, it was gone. Uh, right. and I, he didn't explain why, but I think right. It was <laughs> right. So I mean, I do, yeah, I do think he. I think he saw the importance of going in a certain direction. And then in the back of his mind, he's thinking, oh, damn, Frey's problem. I need fine grained resources. And I mean, a lot of my conversations with him, and I think Susan Schneider had similar kinds of conversations with him, it was about how to put those two pieces together. That's what I was describing as the kind of fundamental tension, right? So like my suggested resolution to that is just dig in and draw a distinction. And be careful about what what's doing, you know, which resources are doing what work. But I don't think he was ever happy with that. Okay. Uh, great. So I was wondering if Photostar doesn't still need the to take into account formal features to do the concepts. Because I'm thinking Photostar still has this account of the concept of laws, and laws are connecting properties of mental symbols to properties in the world. Yeah. And those properties are going to have to be the formal properties. Yeah. And and I always just like the idea that those properties are something like functional properties of individuated by the role of computation for that kind of reason. But I think he just has to have this commitment to syntactic properties in order to be able to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I, I didn't mean to be denying. I, concepts have formal properties. Concepts, you know, there's role facts about concepts. That's all. Photoshop agrees with all of that. The question is whether those are the kinds of things you can build a theory of concepts out of. So I do think, I mean, one, I don't know if this is going to be super helpful, but um, if you think about the nature of the reference or representation relation, that's this high level abstract thing, right? That's going to have to be implemented by Coro, term from Eric, wherever you want, um, by sustaining mechanisms. And so I think there's a, a, a plausible way to fit the pieces together by saying the formal properties of symbols, the role that they play, you know, that's going to be part of the implementation story. Of the representation. But by thinking not at the level of the implementation, but at the level of what the law that fixes the reference looks like. If you go for the very yeah. where you're like, 
there's a law yeah. such that if you have a symbol, then yeah. So the view has to be that those mechanisms implement the law rather than you know constituting the law, or the game's over. But isn't that taken back, like the idea that there is a law connecting with syntactic properties? No, there is a law, and it, the kinds of things that you're gesturing to, they play a role in implementing that law, right? But the law doesn't mention the law. a particular. Like I was thinking, the law has to mention like a mentally word. Oh, so this was the, que the, the question I made in passing. Exactly. That, that yeah, 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 about, awesome. about um, what's the relata of the reference. And relation. I'm thinking that right. was going to be a syntactic property, which is exactly Yeah, 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 okay. So um, I have half-baked uh, thoughts about this. Um, so I'll just really, really quickly, and maybe we can talk afterwards if this is at all interesting, okay? Yeah. One route you could kind of go, that you could try to go is, Voters already committed to the counterfactuals being super important in terms of uh, making sense of what this law like relation is. So maybe you can define reference for just token concepts. Okay? You're gonna have to, I mean, the counterfactuals are gonna, you know, carry a heavy, heavy burden there. But he's already kind of committed to that, so maybe that's okay. Alternatively, there are other types that he can appeal to, they're just not types of concepts. So you're right, um, you know. We can cook up types in terms of the formal properties, in terms of the computational role that concepts play. And maybe it's those you know, fine-grained types that the representation relation is defined for. Yeah. So that also seems like an option. Yeah. And I, I mean, I kind of pushed it a little bit on this and just didn't get very far. You didn't, you know, go one way or the other. Um, yeah. In front. In front. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was wondering, like, um, what's the advantage of the view that I'm going for over thinking uh, concepts of two-dimensional context? Um, so there's one dimension that's shared, and then we put a one that's just a reference, and yeah. there's other dimension of content which accounts for like for those types of things. Yeah. Okay, so you, th there's two questions in the vicinity. One is, why I prefer voter star over voter? Um, but there's another question that, that um, is something like, why don't we just acknowledge that there's concepts coarse grained and then there's concepts fine grained, right? I'm okay with that. In fact, there's a, a, a sort of idiom in the literature, conceptions, right? So you might think, yeah, there's these fine grained things, conceptions, and then there's these coarse grained things, concepts. I'm okay with that as long as we don't start cheating and writing conception, names of conceptions in capital letters and assuming that they can do all the work that the theory of concepts is supposed to do, okay? So just as a matter of terminology, that's, that's fine with me. You know, we can officially recognize there's these coarse grain thing concepts, there's these fine grain things conceptions, right? But let's just not run them together. Let's not, uh, you know, maybe there's a, I mean, I don't think there's gonna end up being a Hesperus and a Phosphorus conception. There's gonna be a whole bunch of conceptions that we can appeal to to explain <coughs> those cases we're inclined to describe between Hesperus and Phosphorus, right? Um, but as long as we don't just start writing Hesperus in capital letters and say, that's a concept type, then I'm okay with that. I mean, it seems there's a symmetry, because it also seems that uh, people like fine grain stuff are going to say, yeah, it's okay to say that there's this coarse grain stuff, but let us not think that it can do all, yeah. the, all the work yeah. that uh, we want, like yeah. our concepts yeah. to do. Like, I, I'm, yeah. I'm totally fine with that. Yeah. There was also some stuff at the end I didn't get to. I think I called it concept pluralism on the handout that addresses this question. Yeah. One last question. Yeah. Oh, uh, thanks. So, uh, so I think Craig's problem doesn't massively generalize in the, way oh, okay. you, in the way that you suggested, because it was always intended to be a question about how a rational agent could uh, fail to you believe that you know yeah. this is Hesperus and fail to believe that this is phosphorus, and, and the key word is rational. So, not any worry is going to count as a rational worry, and the thought, um, and so here's where syntax comes in in a way that I think is is useful. Right, so the idea is that if rational transitions are the ones that where the syntax mirrors the semantic relations in the right yeah. way, then you have a count of what rational transitions are. And yeah. then if you use the syntax to individuate the concepts, then you can give an account of why it is. So you give an account of Frege's puzzle that respects the idea that it are, uh, it's going to arise in these cases where it's rational to believe yeah. that this is Hesperus and Okay, so it. let me back up okay. a little. Um, so why is it that, I mean, what we're trying to characterize here is <coughs> facts about someone's psychology. Don't we want those also to capture facts about people who are irrational? I mean, why is there a limit to, in this kind of context, I'm not making a claim about 
uh, other contexts in which Gregory's problem is. Well, at least written. here we have a way of, and like this is not my view. This is I'm just trying to defend yeah. defend voter here. I mean, I think we have a way of distinguishing between certain kinds of failures that are rational failures. Those are the ones where the syntax are doing is doing the thing that it's supposed to do. Yeah. And then there are all sorts of other ways where there might be failures, but they're going to have different explanations. Oh, I see. So, so maybe there's a principled way of, of drawing a line between um, the cases that we do need, to, that we do want the theory of concepts to explain, and the other ones. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm not sure exactly what to say. That's a that's a, a interesting suggestion. Yeah. The other the other thing I was just gonna it's a cheap point, but I don't think it's just about um, uh, rationality or irrationality. It's also if someone has the right false beliefs, they might be rational, but you know, you can get all these crazy cases off the ground just by giving someone a false belief and then let them be rational. So I, I think the cases are going to explode because of that too. But right, I guess I thought, I, I guess the thought was um, there are certain kinds of ra mistakes that count as rational in virtue of the concepts that are operative, right? And that uh, was sort of Frege's insight and I, I saw voter as trying to respect that right. um, by appeal to syntax. And, and that is something that um, that doesn't get preserved, I think, on the kind of yeah. picture that you're advocating. Yeah. Thank you.